I've been asked to speak to you about student experiences of post-secondary stratification um, because not everyone's college experience is quite the same and counts for quite the same thing. The insights I'm going to share with you today are grounded in research primarily from my two books. The first one, Paying for the Party, which is co-authored with Elizabeth Armstrong, and the second one, Parenting to a Degree, um, but also some research that I've been conducting at my own home campus now, which is UC Merced and research at UC Riverside, plus insights uh, from many post-secondary scholars. I'm going to give you a quick roadmap on what we're going to cover today. I'm going to identify five processes that create unequal post-secondary experiences for students, both across the post-secondary sector, but also what I want to emphasize is within a single school ways in which students' experiences can vary. These processes tend to advantage affluent white students and disadvantage low-income students, first-generation students, and those from typically underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. Now, the processes I'm going to talk about today are exacerbated um, by something that has come up many times. I refer to it as marketization. Marketization occurs when the provision of college as a collective public good is replaced by a consumer service system which is geared toward the generation of student tuition. Marketization has numerous consequences for how students experience the provision of post-secondary education. Now, the first two processes I'm going to identify are inter-school inter inequities. That is, they are differences in resources available to students across the post-secondary sector. First, I want to talk about differentiation or how sharp the distinctions are between schools in the post-secondary sector. These are distinctions that we might see uh, growing even more sharp over time. Um, hierarchies within our sector are backed, uh, the prestige hierarchies um, are backed by real resource inequities, and there's also an increasing difference between private and public institutions as they're drifting apart. I want to show you this graph, which I got from Jane Wellman at the Delta Cost Project. It shows where new money versus new students went in the early 2000s. Enrollment growth is concentrated in public institutions, which have also had less access to new resources to help compensate for this growth. It sort of visually represents what we've been talking about today. You can see this by comparing the green bar, which represents the change in spending per student between 1999 and 2009, and the purple bar, which is the change in total enrollment, and there is an inverse relationship. This is really problematic because we're starting to see um, we're starting to see stark differences in the provision of basic resources in w between well-resourced schools and poorly resourced schools, and these differences have really um, shaped the experiences of the students that attend those schools. For example, student to advisor ratios have been steadily rising at public schools, particularly at community colleges, where they can reach as high as 1 to 1,500. So one advisor with 1,500 students. My own campus, the ratio in the school where I'm at is 1 to 800. So 800 students go seek out one advisor. In contrast, at elite private schools, where you have a lot of endowment money. One of, the, one of the things I like to say is that the per student endowment reserves for many schools actually run into the millions of dollars. People are like, no, that's crazy. No, it's true. Um, advising remains much more extensive and much more personalized in that context. Now, differentiation wouldn't matter as much if it wasn't paired with a second process, which I refer to as diversion. Diversion occurs when, regardless of their potential, low-income and minority students are more likely to access the lower status and less resourced options. In contrast, particularly in a market-based system, but as we've seen from Mike's research today, um, it's been the story for higher education, 
Um, these families who are affluent and well-educated have the means, knowledge, and access, often via preferences for legacy students, which is a form of affirmative action for the wealthy. Um, athletes and those who can pay full freight get to attend the most prestigious and well-researched schools. Indeed, um, in the US, increases in black and Latino students since the 1900s have occurred mainly um, at open access colleges, uh, whereas white's college enrollment has increased only at the top 500 universities. Thus, we have a situation where the most vulnerable students attend the least resource institutions. The students that need the most get the least. Next, I'm going to switch to intra-school inequities, which are differences in resources available to students within a single school. Again, the processes described below um, have been exacerbated by marketization. So public four-year residential schools aggressively compete for out-of-state and international student tuition. This is one of those conundrums that Martin Kenny mentioned. Um, they've needed to do this because of public disinvestment. As this graph illustrates, these students bring considerably more dollars. You can also see the increasing gap between average in-state and average out-of-state tuition at public universities. Now, to compete for the finite, and it is a finite number, of families who are willing to and able to pay out-of-state tuition in the United States, schools often have to attract them in some way. And so one of the ways that they can attract them is through a party pathway provision. <laughs> um, Nebraska, Missouri State, although there are many, there is this great New York Times article with like lazy rivers, just like the, the, the lazy river boom in universities, and that was where I got that picture. And then that, I actually don't know where that came from, but that could have been at Midwest U, one of the, the universities I studied. Um, many socially oriented affluent families whose children aren't going to qualify for elite privates, which is where they would prefer to send them, um, and some of those who do are seeking um, what I've called in my research a party pathway. They want a robust Greek system, big sports conference, party reputation. Um, they want luxurious recreation centers and lazy rivers. Um, and they also want an array of less difficult majors that make it easier for their students to get to graduation. The problem is that this infrastructure isn't equally experienced or equally accessible to all. Well, that's one problem. I often think about a cruise ship metaphor where everyone's on the same vessel, the same amenities are there, but then you've got people who are picking up sweaty towels and slinging drinks at the bar while everyone else is having like the time of their life. It's a huge difference in the same institution. And this happens at every school. Another problem is this infrastructure doesn't necessarily serve the vast majority of students well. Public university resources are often zero sum. And I'm not saying we saw that chart of spending. I'm not saying that people are, you know, the problem is we're all spending, you know, we're all building big football stadiums. But for example, um, you can look at many schools have been doing what they call um, merit aid leveraging. So they're taking things that used to be need based scholarships and they're they're parceling them to small merit aid, and they're giving it to affluent families whose kids did pretty decent in high school, even if they're wanting this, and they give them that little incentive to come, to come from out of state. That's what I mean when resources are zero sum, and when they go to some groups, they don't go to other groups. Building up this pathway can then come at a cost um, for the students that need a mobility pathway. They need social and academic infrastructure to achieve economic mobility. And most schools do have small and visible programs that serve these students, but they're not large enough. They don't serve enough students. Um, and those, uh, most of the students that need them go unserved. Okay, internal differentiation occurs when university resources are un inequitably distributed across the student population. The party pathway is one example. Another example, though, is the development of competitive academic programs that provide some students with smaller classes, more contact with faculty, research opportunities, internship support, and relationships with high-profile employers. Examples would include things like honors programs, pre-law, pre-med, um, and highly competitive business schools. Students who come from affluent families are most likely to secure these spots. 
um, which tend to require a high GPA. They tend to require some knowledge of college in advance to, to get into them or knowledge of that program. Families can even be lured across state lines for these programs. A natural corollary, though, is with tracking in secondary, primary and secondary schools, where those who are on the top tracks tend to have the most resources. Um, their prior educational advantages and insistent parents secure them educational benefits. At college, privileged groups continue to maintain their advantage by getting these things. At Midwest U, where I studied, you could absolutely have a high quality education, but it wasn't there for everyone. Another way that universities manage in an era of marketization is to rely on parents for funds and labor. So recently, in the past 10 to 15 years, parent programs have emerged at four-year universities. These programs reflect a new family university partnership in which parents are asked to play an important role in the form and function of higher education. I bring my friendly badgers to you today. Um, this, illus this illustrates my point perfectly, but you could go on any parent program website around the country, indeed I have, and they look like this. So it reads, Badger parents are protective of their young, whether out in the world or at home, in touch with their sons and daughters at the UW. Mom and dad's involvement in their college students' lives has increased in recent years. Skipping ahead, our nationally recognized parent program helps parents embrace their new role as mentors and coaches. Now, in this partnership, universities seek out highly resourced and well-educated parents whose pockets are deep, whose time, expertise, and connections can ensure student persistence and placement. And they kind of shame them a little bit into doing this. They also send the thing like, here's a care package. Typically, good parents send a care package at least three times a year. Um, and so parents will do that, right, um, if they have those resources. So parents get drawn more, get drawn into this, not just in the financial component, but the labor part. Um, they assist with recruitment, advising, psychological, psychological support, career development, even student safety. They can compensate for spotty academic advice. So who cares if there's a 1 to 800 ratio if your parents are super well informed? My kids have two professor parents. They're going to be fine, right? <laughs> I don't even know what this I like. My parents didn't go to college. This, I'm frequently floored by that thought. Um, Parental resources can help produce some of the indicators on which universities are increasingly judged, such as graduation rates, post-college earnings. And of course, young people who sail through their school are going to be more likely to send money back afterwards. Parents enter into this labor-intensive compact because they also stand to benefit. They demand access to specific university infrastructure that facilitates their particular plans for class privilege. The invitation to hover means they can out-compete, out-network, out-support everyone else, even at the same school, securing advantages for their youth. This arrangement tends to harden class inequities in higher education by increasing the salience of family background for post-secondary and also early occupational success. Students with affluent, connected, involved parents have a greater chance of reading, reaching to graduation, they, um, which contributes to these large gaps in class, uh, college completion. Um, in, out, in the transition out of college, students who have parental bridging support, um, for example, money to get them to where active labor, mar labor markets are, um, connections to secure them a job, are more likely to obtain jobs that are higher paying and require a BA. This may help to explain potential emerging evidence of differences in earnings among college graduates along the lines of social class. So in conclusion, inequities in student experiences occur not only across types of schools, which is more commonly recognized, I think, but also within schools. Indeed, there may be as much or more within school variation in the types of experiences that students have as there is across schools. Secondly, inequities in student experiences may have increased in recent years due to marketization. Um, as government resources recede, schools rely more and more on private funds, private support. Under this equation, if you can pay more, you're more likely to get what you want. I mean, that's just sort of the basic economics of it. Um, also, a reliance on parents as a stopgap measure may have really long-term implications on the ability of universities, in particular public state systems, to help youth from disadvantaged and underrepresented backgrounds achieve mobility. 
That's it.